Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. Well, welcome back, you guys. And for those online, welcome. You know, we know there's a lot more people online watching than there is in the room. But I'll tell you, it sure is nice to see faces again and just to interact and say words that are heard with your ears, with armpits of victory. It's great, you guys. And uh, uh, for those, you know, life is returning a little bit back to normal now, isn't it? It feels like we are, we're experiencing just some somewhat regular, although it is a little strange that we're all kind of sitting apart. Doesn't it make you feel exposed? It's like you all showed up naked to church. Some of you watching online are naked in church. But there's those that are, it, it's when you're sitting and there's nobody else around you, you do feel a bit exposed. You feel a little, well, that's good. Let Jesus use that to just to bring life to your heart and uh, just to do something deep inside of you today. And you know, as things are starting to return back to normal, I think we have to ask uh, the question, do we want everything to go back to normal? You know, as this, as this whole thing started, there were, there were just certain elements of life that, it, you know, as this started, now it's, that's three months ago, so it's almost, it's almost easy to forget. We're almost tired of talking about it. But there were things that, that, that some of that time and some of the busyness that went away, right away I realized this is actually a good thing. This is act, the, the busyness that is just uh, saturating our life, activity after activity, but not really taking time to make sure the soul is healthy. Um, I, some, when some of that stopped, it's like, this is a good thing that this has stopped. And there's, as we go back to normal, I think we need to have some intentionality as to what do we want to not let go back to the way things were. Because out of every crisis, you know, there's a saying that in, in the leadership world, there's a saying, it says, never, a good leader never lets a good crisis go to waste. And there's, there's something that happens in crisis that you can, you can make changes in your life in a time of crisis that you won't make any other time in your life. And as we kind of move through this, hopefully move through this crisis and, and, and are getting near the end of it. Let's ask the question, what do we want? What do we want to look like on the other side? And, uh, you know, there's, uh, Jesus, talked about, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven. He talked about it often. And this was his message was the kingdom of heaven. He came to, he came to show us how to live in the kingdom of heaven. And he gave, he gave these illustrations. And uh, I want to I look at one of them today in Matthew chapter 13. And you can, uh, if you have a Bible, you can read along with me. And it says that uh, he, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Everybody say, the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. It's like a hidden treasure. Now, Jesus gave all of these different examples or, or parables or stories of what the kingdom he of heaven was, but he, he did it to teach us how to, how to find the kingdom of heaven and, and how to live in the kingdom of heaven. And he said, this, this is, um, he, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure. And you know, the, what, what I learned from this, or what I kind of take from this, is that, that life, the way Jesus intended, is not always just set right in front of you, easy to find. Sometimes you know there's something better, 
but you're not always sure, how do I live in that? How do I experience that? It, it doesn't, the, the kingdom of heaven doesn't always arrive in an Amazon package. That you just put your, your order in and then two days later, you don't, you don't even have to pay for delivery. It just shows up. It doesn't, the kingdom of heaven doesn't show up as, uh, you know, how to find life in three easy steps. Although I will have three easy steps later in the message. You know, what Jesus was saying is that we have to make a decision that we're, uh, not, o- not only do we want to find the kingdom of, he- of heaven, but we actually have to search for it. There's a, there's a searching that has to take place. Uh, he didn't just say it was like treasure. He said it was like hidden treasure. It was like something that, that you had to go find. But not only was it hidden treasure, but, but it was something that when the, when the man found the hidden treasure, he actually didn't own the field. So then he rehid the treasure. And then Jesus basically was saying, to get the kingdom of heaven, there is a price that has to be paid. And when you, know, when you know something is worth having in your life, you do what you need to get it. When something, there, and, and, and he, Jesus is saying that the, the kingdom of heaven, it's not cheap, but it's valuable. It's precious. It's something that's worth getting in our lives and whatever you need to do to get it, go and get it. And, and you know, we, we talk about this, uh, Jesus talked about this kingdom of heaven all the time. And sometimes th- this can be a bit of a confu- confusing topic because we don't always know, well, what does that mean? What does the kingdom of heaven mean? It means I go to heaven when I die? Well, you know, what does that matter right now? But the kingdom of heaven, um, you know, it actually represents a lot more than an eternal destination. In fact, the kingdom of heaven wasn't something that was about eternity. It was actually something that was about right now. It was about a way of living right now that was heavenly, that was right, and righteous. So in in uh, Romans, Paul talked about the kingdom of heaven, and he, and he, he, ta- he said there's three traits that kind of uh, stand out about the kingdom of heaven. And he said it's these three traits. It's rightness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Rightness, peace, and joy. These are the things that God wants to bring. He wants to move the areas of our life that are not right. He wants to bring them into rightness. The areas of your life where you're not experiencing peace, he wants to bring your life and move your life into a place of peace where your life is not filled with joy, he wants, to be, he wants to begin to shift your life from whatever that experience is right now and begin to shift it into a place where you're experiencing joy. You know, righteousness, peace, and joy. You know, we all long for righteousness. We all long for that rightness. We want things to be right. There is just, when things aren't right, you hear about it. Don't you? You know, when just... Just try, you know, giving one kid twice the chips as the other kid. You will get a lecture on the kingdom of heaven really quick. That is not right. That's not fair. You know, we, we have an inherent desire for things to be right. Peace. And you know what I love about, about peace is peace is actually not something that we have to create. It's something that God created and he invited us to enter into. It's something that God created and he invites us to, to experience it and live in it. When Jesus walked the earth, he said, he said to his disciples, my peace I give to you. He didn't say, I need you to work hard to be peaceful. He said, I am going to, I'm giving you my peace. And this, this word peace is shalom. And shalom is, we don't have an English word, that's the equivalent. Shalom means so much more than just absence of conflict. Shalom is this, it, it's actually, a, it's a complicated word. word. It's, it's a, it means a state of completeness. Shalom refers to a, a complex, kind of a complex, multi-piece, multi-faceted uh, conglomeration of things coming together in a state of completeness and wholeness. Uh, where they're where they're healthy, this is this was what Jesus said. I'm giving this to you. 
I'm giving you this peace. You don't, you don't have to try and manufacture this peace because if you're like me, there's times that you can't manufacture it. There's times it's like you just, it's like I need something that's greater than what I can just do myself. It's a, peace, it's a peace that starts inwardly, and then it works its way outwardly. It's not behavior management. It's a, you know, that, that's the kind of peace that you have to enforce in the home when the siblings are going at her. <clears throat> There's nothing, there is nothing that will test your faith like young children, <laughs> even teenage children, at war with one another. It, at, at that point, so you realize peace has to come from somewhere else because, because uh, the, you know, the conflict is real, people, and the armpits are not victorious. <laughs> you know, many of, the, many of the conflicts that we see around the world, we want, we want to see people change laws or we want to see people legislate change, but you can't legislate shalom. You can't legislate Peace, be, because shalom, shalom is what happens in the hearts. Shalom is what happens inwardly, and it, when, when that happens inwardly, that changes us outwardly. No government has ever been able to change hearts in human history, but Jesus changes hearts, and he does it, he does it through his peace. And then the last thing was joy, and again, joy is more than just happiness, you know, the, the, the rightness, the peace, and the joy of the kingdom of heaven, it's not just a, this, that's not just a paste a smile on your face and call it a happy day. This is something that comes from a source outside of ourselves. You know, the psalmist said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And what, what he was saying is that, that there is a joy that comes to my life that doesn't originate in me. It comes from God. And this is, this is what happened. True, true peace True right, true rightness, or true righteousness, and true joy, come. They come from our hearts, and they they. It's something that that God puts through us. It's not something that he we have to manufacture. And so, when we look at what Jesus taught, and what when he walked the earth, he was continually coming back to the heart. He was continually addressing. He was continually continually addressing the heart. In fact, if you go all through scripture, there's this continual theme of what God wants to do is going to start in inside, in your heart. And so today I want to talk, I want to talk about our heart. I want to talk about our heart in a biblical sense. Now, in, in our kind of our Western culture, we kind of think of our heart as our feelings, but in the biblical sense, our heart is just kind of every, all the stuff going on inside the flesh. That's kind of your heart, your core, your, your inward life. It's your thinking, it's your emotions, it's your reactions. It's, it's kind of how you process life. Everything going on that's not flesh is, is your heart. And so it, much more than just feelings and emotions, it's, it's our core. And I want, today I want to talk about a well-ordered heart. A well-ordered heart. And you know, as, we, as we're on this series, Into the Unknown, you know, one of the most valuable things as you're going into the future is to have a well-ordered heart. Those with a well-kept or well-ordered heart, they're prepared for and capable of responding to situations of life in ways that are good and right, in ways that are constructive, in, in ways that produce good things. Just give me a, a refreshing beverage moment. You know, Proverbs 25, it says, like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his heart. You know, it's, 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 like, it's like all the doors are open and everybody can just take advantage when there's no control over our heart. You know, years ago, <clears throat> uh, when, I, when I was in uh, Bible school, I'd have been 18, maybe 19, uh, Pastor Brian Thompson gave me a book to read and, and uh, it was called Ordering Your Private World. 
It was, and it was, uh, it was a book. I, it was quite good at the time. I don't know if it's still good, but it was really good at the time. It was kind of one of those things that a young, undisciplined man needs to read. Somebody who's, you know, kind of doesn't take very much seriously. You'd never get that impression from me, but it's <laughs> the, uh, but the, you know, the, this book had right in its introduction, it, it talks about, basically it talks about our, our heart is like, um, it's like the bridge of a ship. And it's like not just any ship, but like a large ship that's going through a storm. And in, you know, in, in, any, in any kind of situation like that where a ship maybe is going through a storm or going through the, through the winds and the waves and there's crisis, there's all sorts of activity going on on the ship. And there's all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of things taking place. Excuse me, that was a little moist there. And <laughs> the, uh, on, the, on the ship, though, you will you will never find the captain. Go, you won't never find him out in the middle of the storm, scrubbing the deck, or hoisting a sail, or batting down the hatches. Or let's think of another stereotypical saying that we can, you know, anchor awaying. You know, you'll never find the captain doing those things. Where you find the captain is you find him at the helm. And you find him calm and in order. And, you know, this is, the, as, as in this book, the, the author Gordon MacDonald, he, he basically said, you know, a well-ordered heart or a heart that's in order is like the captain of a ship that's in the midst of a storm that can keep control of the ship in the storm. And, you know, as we, as we go forward, we never know what the future is going to hold. But the one thing we do know is that if our heart is well-ordered, our future will be good. Our future will be able to, to face it without running out and trying to, you know, you know, freaking out and trying to fix or trying to do. But just having that well-ordered core that takes, forward, uh, takes us forward into God's best for our future. And so I want to talk today. Uh, about three areas that we need in our life for a well-ordered heart. Three areas. The first is personal freedom. The, fir- the second is meaning. And the third is relationships. And we're going to look at these a little more in depth. The first one's personal freedom. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about freedom. Freedom is actually the core message of the gospel. When it comes right down to it, Jesus came to set us free. He came to bring freedom uh, from oppression. He came to bring freedom from bondage, freedom from sin, freedom from anxiety, freedom of spirit. He came came to set us free. The gospel could very accurately be described as, or summed up as Jesus came to bring us freedom. But our Western version of freedom isn't the same as the gospel version of freedom. Our Western version of freedom, it's not, it's it's really, it's selfish. It's about you can't tell me what to do, which is very different than the freedom that Jesus came to bring, which is I want you to be free to do what you need to do. Whereas our version, it's, 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 you know, it's distorted it's a distorted version. And, you know, the, the West, we're, we're based on a belief that as individuals are given freedom, they will flourish. And we know this is true. And where, where this came from is it, it, it really was birthed out of an era or a time where most people lived under social, political, or religious oppression. And so, you know, North America was established because people wanted the freedom to worship God the way that they felt they should be able to worship God without being told how to worship God, but just the freedom to, to do that. That's why, this con- that, that's why North America exists the way it exists. And so we know there's, there's tremendous truth that freedom, uh, that freedom, that humans are happy when we're free. But 
Western culture has taken personal freedom, and we've swung way over to personal freedom is everything. Personal freedom, you, like, like, if you want, if you want to touch, if you want to commit the unforgivable sin in our culture, take away someone's personal freedom. Just try it with your kids. Like you will, you will just get an object lesson in the real time of their, you know, personal freedom. To touch someone's personal freedom is the unforgivable sin of Western society. And what, what happens is because we value personal freedom so much in Western society, what happens is we end up sacrificing the other two, meaning and relationship. We end up sacrificing those two in order to preserve freedom. So it's kind of like freedom at all costs. It doesn't matter. Those other two, it's like if, if they fit in, that's okay. But freedom is what's important. But we actually need to learn how to balance these three together. We need to, we need to, learn, uh, we need to learn because our heart depends on it. Personal freedom alone will not leave us well-ordered. In fact, excess personal freedom doesn't result in freedom. Excess personal freedom doesn't lead in freedom. It leads to bondage. When you can do whatever you want with no restriction, you don't end up free. You end up enslaved. And it leads to a dulling of feeling. It leads to a dulling of emotion. Paul, Paul said it very well. Uh, in, in Corinthians, he said, May, or was it Corinthians? It wasn't Corinthians. Paul said it really good somewhere in the New Testament. Your assignment <laughs> is to find it this week. Someone will, want someone will shout it out. Don't shout it out. Just, just, just let me be humiliated alone. <laughs> but Paul said, I am free. Just because I am free to do anything I want doesn't mean I will do anything I want. And he said, I, I'm free to do whatever I want, but I will not allow myself to be mastered by anything. And so he's saying, I am completely free, but freedom is not, completely free isn't the goal. See, true freedom is not the ability to say yes. True freedom is the ability to say no. True freedom is not the ability to say yes. See, freedom is the ability for the anxious to say no to fear and say yes to faith. Freedom, you know, true freedom is freedom for the alcoholic. It's the ability to say no to another drink or the drug addict or the food addict. It's true freedom is the ability to say no to what we don't want in our life, to say no to it to say we don't want it. That kind of freedom does not come from government. <laughs> that type of freedom, you won't find it in an Amazon package. That type of freedom has to come from somewhere different. That has to come, that's, that's the type of freedom that comes from what we call the kingdom of heaven. And it comes from within. See, it's a gift. This kind of freedom is a gift. To Ephesians 2, it says that it's a gift, that salvation or this, this type of freedom is a gift of grace. It says we don't do anything to earn it. All we can actually do is just receive it. You know, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and even that faith didn't come from yourself. It's, it's like you, you're saved by faith. God gives you the faith so he can give you the salvation. He gives us the faith. So we, he, that we can experience the freedom. You know, the, the moment you realize that God has saved you and that you don't have to do anything to earn it, I, I would call that your true first day of freedom. That's, that's, that's kind of like opening the door to true freedom. Freedom is, is a powerful and necessary part of a well-ordered heart. But freedom is not the end goal. Freedom is not the only part. The second, the second thing is meaning. We need meaning. Human, humans, humanity, we need to know that what we're doing counts. 
that what we're doing matters, that, that we're more, we have a more significant purpose than just our immediate gratification or, or paying our bills or paying our mortgage or having food on the table. There needs to be more to our life than just what we need right now. See, Ephesians 2, it says that it's by grace you're saved, you, but it's by grace you've been given freedom. But it goes on in verse 10, it wasn't, it, it's not just for the sake of being saved or free, it's because there's good works for you to do. And it says that we've been set free in order to do something significant. He gives us this gift of salvation, but it's not just so we can sit around and say, oh, we're saved. It's because there's something great that he wants, wants us to do. And my goodness, I am so out of time. Mike, you're a rambler. Significance and meaning play a vital role in keeping our heart well ordered. We need purpose. Personal freedom without meaning actually leads to despair. We can do whatever we want, but none of it matters. None of it makes a difference. Personal freedom without meaning Meaning takes from the personal freedom reserves and says, I can do whatever I want, but what I want is to do something significant. Uh, what I want is to do something that matters. And then the third area that we need to have to have a well-ordered heart, it's this area called relationships. And I actually wanted to spend most of my time on this point. Now it's my mo message has one second left. <clears throat> So I'm going to give you a really quick summary version of this. You were created for relationship. Some of you felt it when you walked in and just saw faces today. I want to encourage you, if you're online, we will have tickets next week. If you're in the building, we would ask you to just hold off getting tickets until later in the week so that those who are online want to It is, you know what? It's weird, but it is so nice to see faces again and resist the urge to hug each other. I know that sounds funny. But it, there's something about we are created for relationship. And an integral part of a well-ordered heart is healthy relationships. Relationships keep us balanced. They keep us healthy. They shape us and they form us. And this, especially if you're like me and you have a personality type that gravitates towards isolation, you need to understand that there's things that happen in your life and relationship that don't happen anywhere else. And when, you, when we isolate from others, we actually end up unhealthy. We've all known that person who completely isolated and they ended up, you know, collecting cats. Or, you know, there, there's things that just, they just, relationship keeps us, hell, if you like, like cats, God loves you too. <clears throat> actually don't have a problem with cats at all. It's just cats are fun to make fun of because they don't take it personally. <laughs> they don't take anything personally. They just don't care. That's why they're a great pet. It's because you just don't have to invest that much in them. <clears throat> Anyways. <laughs> Mike, time. You know, I want to skip through that. You don't need to know that. Is there's, there's this interesting thing. There's this thing called integration that takes place when we come together. And it's not just when we come together, uh, like in relationships of convenience. It's not just over shared mutual interest. It, this is not the kind of relationship where it's like, well, we show up at the gym together. Or, this is relationship where we actually come together and talk to each other about life and about ourselves. And neuroscientists have found that something happens when we come together. Something actually fundamentally changes in our brain when we share our stories together that doesn't take place when we're alone. It doesn't take place when we're interacting online. It happens. And, uh, you know, just to, just to give you, oh, my gosh, i got so much to get through here. If there is, have you ever been watching a show or read an article and all of a sudden an emotional response came up in you? Uh, maybe it was a fear or anxiousness, and, and it's, it's like you don't know why you reacted that way, but you did. And, or something happened around you, and it's like your response was totally out of line with the magnitude 
of what happened around you. It's like it was a little event, but all of a sudden you felt just devastated or you were just angry. You flew off at the handle. You, you know, you kicked the car. You did. It, it's just like your response was not consistent with the event. Yeah. Well, there's a reason for that, and it's, it's called your amygdala. And it's, what happens is when you go through a traumatic event, there's something that switches, our, our brain processes it in, in this, this amygdala, which is the fear or the flight section of your brain. And what it does is it takes every event of your life and it tries to deal with it. I'm not doing this justice. Don't tell me, Mike, you're not a neuroscientist and you butchered this to death. I realize that I have butchered this to death. <laughs> but what happens is it files it away in it kind of splits it and puts it into both both hemispheres of your brain, but it, it they're disintegrated. They're not to, like the, it's not cohesive. So you you actually haven't processed it properly. And then what happens is when you're in a similar situation at any future time in your life, because that your your amygdala, which is basically just raw processing, be, because of the way it handled that situation, it will file all future situations exactly the same way. So if you had a response of fear, whenever you're in a similar similar situation, fear will be your response. Even though it, in all rationality, you're like, I shouldn't be afraid of this. I know that I shouldn't be afraid of this, yet I'm afraid of this. Or it causes anger. And it's like, I, I know I shouldn't be angry, but I can't help myself. I'm just angry. Well, it's because you've had this processing that took place once in your life. Well, there needs it, what happened. What happens is this event has disintegrated you. It's disintegrated you. And there is a way that integration. There's only one way integration can take place in our lives, where those sep those events have been separated in your brain and. And they need to come together and there needs to be a healthy joining of your left and right hemisphere. The only way that that takes place is through face-to-face -face sharing of our stories with one another. God designed you to need other people. In fact, the only thing that God, when he looked at creation, said was not good. As he looked at Adam who was alone and he said, it is not good for man to be alone. No sin, Adam and God. No problems in the garden, nothing wrong. And God said, it's not good for him to be alone. You know, you realize with that, God was admitting he wasn't enough for Adam. Think about that. God himself said, I, my relationship is not enough for Adam. He needs others like him to bring completeness to his life. We need relationship to be healthy. Father, we want to experience life the way you designed us to experience life. Father, we give you permission to just lead us and shape us and take us forward the way that you want us to go forward. And, and Father, we don't want to try and manufacture peace. We don't want to try and manufacture joy or manufacture rightness, but we want to enter into that that rightness and that peace and that joy that you've prepared for us to live in. And I'm just going to lead us in a prayer right now. And if you're online and maybe you've never prayed or maybe you're in this room and you've never prayed a, a prayer saying yes to Jesus, I want to just encourage you to just, to just join us now. It's just a prayer saying yes to following him, yes to allowing him to work in our lives and in our hearts. And I want to invite you, if you've never prayed that, we're going to pray this together as a church, I want to invite you wherever you're at, you can just pray that with us right now. Let's pray together. Jesus, I, I want to experience life the way you intended. I want to follow you. Would you come into my life? Would you order my heart? Set my heart right. Flood my life with your peace and your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.